are many old buildings in Britain which have their history written in blood, but even among these, the mansion in tonight's story is special. It's a matter of historical record that Little Cut House in Wiltshire was once the setting for a terrible murder. 400 years on, those who know the house well claim that this dark deed is a legacy which reverberates down the ages. In over 700 years of continuous habitation, Littlecote House in rural Wiltshire has been owned by only six families. Littlecote has witnessed many events in its turbulent history, and all have left their mark on the building. One of its most notorious owners lived here in the 16th century. His name was William Darrell, but his reputation earned him the title Wild Will. One dark night, a local midwife, Mother Barnes, was called to the house with the promise of high reward if she would attend a lady who was about to give birth. Conducted up six steps of stone, she passed the hall at the 20th stride, mounts one and 30 glossy stairs, and lo, the bandage is untied. I sent for you to do your work. Do it well and save the lady. If you succeed, you will be well rewarded. If you fail, and the maiden dies, then you too shall die. You have a beautiful baby son, my dear. Well, woman, so you've succeeded. My lord, you have a beautiful son, but he has no clothes to keep him warm, said this apron of mine. I have no use for this child, nor any other child. I bid thee dispose of it with all haste. Oh, my lord, I beg of you, let me take him a care from him as if he were my own. I will say nothing. You have my sworn word on it. Give me the child. <gasps> Die. And let guilt, shame, and sorrow die with you. Whilst Mother Barnes was attending to the lady in the bed, she took a cutting of the bed hanging. She was blindfolded again, taken down the stairs which she counted, and back to her cottage where she was given a bag of cold and told to keep her mouth shut. She went into her cottage, but her conscience started to niggling away at her. And next morning, she decided to go to the magistrate and confess what had happened at Littlecote House. She was able to match the bed hanging, and Darrell was arrested. Darrell was quite an influential man and was able to bribe a judge to get him off the charge. While out riding, Darrell met an early end when a ball of fire from the sky caused his horse to rear. He was thrown and broke his neck. Oh. A curse on them. Damn them. Damn them all to hell. This unhappy story was recorded by John Aubrey in the 17th century and also features in Sir Walter Scott's poem, Rokeby. After Darrell's death, Littlecote was seized by the then Lord Chief Justice, Sir John Popham. Darrell had used the house as a bribe to get off the charge of infanticide. The identity of the mother was never established. Locals believe she may have been Will Darrell's sister. Despite Darrell's curse, the Popham family held on to Littlecote until 1929, when Sir Ernest Wills bought it. Lady Wills believes that the legacy of Darrell's deeds may live on. To me, the house was very friendly, very nice, and I really enjoyed living there. But a lot of people who came had some very strange happenings and experiences. One night, I was in my room, and I heard footsteps coming along the corridor, and they stopped at the door, which was very strange, because I thought somebody was coming in. It sounded as though somebody was just walking along and coming into the room. But nobody came into the room, so I thought, well, that's my husband. So I threw open the door and there was nobody there. When my daughter told me about the footsteps, I wasn't in the least surprised because I had heard the same footsteps many and many a time when I stayed there. Uh, I told her it was rubbish because I didn't want her to be frightened. But one night I had been reading 
and I lifted my eyes and suddenly there was someone standing at the foot of the bed holding what I took to be a child over her shoulder. She was gazing at me and I gazed at her. We didn't speak, I didn't speak, but she just looked and a look of calm and peace came over her face and with that she faded away from the room completely. And fame reports the lady comes with babe of fire at dead of night, but harmless to the innocent, they come to see that all is right. I was at the bottom of the cantilever staircase and looked up and suddenly a figure glided along the brown landing and it was that of a lady. She was obviously very young and her fair hair was blowing out behind her. It was a split second to see her, but I've never forgotten it. In 1985, Little Kut was sold to entrepreneur Peter de Savary. He took it on together with all its worldly contents, but he believes he also inherited a rather unworldly aspect of its more recent past. When I saw the house and I liked the house, I decided to hell with the ghosts. I'm going to buy the house anyway, and uh, nothing's going to uh, put me off or frighten me. It was a lovely sunny morning, uh, about nine o'clock, and uh, I was on my way out to the garden because there we were holding an auction uh, of the contents of the house. And as I stepped into the hall, uh, I suddenly saw a lady coming towards me. She was dressed in modern country clothes. And I do remember thinking at the time, gosh, which room did she come out of? She looked straight at me and she said, you are a very evil and wicked man. And she was looking straight at my eyes and I was a taken aback and I said, I beg your pardon, what do you mean? And she said, you have taken my baby's things. They were in the wooden box in the chapel. They belonged to my son and you have taken them away to be sold. And she again stared at me without smiling at all or flinching. And she said, please put them back in the chapel. If you don't, you and your family will be cursed and damned forever in this house. I suppose I could try and find them for you. And she looked at me and she said, and if you do put them back where they belong, you and your family will be blessed forever. And just at that moment, she smiled and she was gone. She was just gone. I was white, I was trembling. I was a man genuinely possessed with uh, fear. Something very unnatural had happened that morning. De Savary quickly found the box in his house. And as I held the box and looked at it, I realized that I had had an experience very few people have ever had. I was holding the baby's clothes and I had been speaking earlier in the morning to the mother, who had come back as a ghost in modern dress with a modern look. I took the box, I went to the chapel, I put it on the window ledge from where it had been taken, said a short prayer in the chapel and told the auctioneer, the sale may now commence. Ten years later, de Savary sold the house to Warner Holidays, the hoteliers. But even Warners insist that the box should remain where it has always been. I'm utterly convinced I saw a ghost that day. I was cooking for a meal in the kitchen for the de Savary family, and all our staff were in period costume at that time. And uh, I see somebody go past me and go into this little room outside of the kitchen. Mary? Mary? I said to Mary, who was working at the kitchen sink, where have you been, Mary? Why have you been out of the room? And she said, I haven't been out of the room at all. She said, I've been here all the time, which of course she must have been because there was no other way out of the kitchen. So I was quite convinced then that I'd seen a ghost. John had just gone down into the cellars. I was here, nobody else in the house. And whilst I was pottering about here, I heard footsteps up above. I thought, that's strange, John's just gone into the cellar. So I dashed upstairs, went through all the rooms up there, not a soul about. About a year ago, I was up in the attics checking things on a Saturday night and was coming down in the Jerusalem stairs, which I've been up and down hundreds of times, hundreds. And I was halfway down the stairs when suddenly I was crashing against the wall. 
I broke my shoulder, my collarbone, and my ribs. And I don't know what happened. I didn't slip, I wasn't pushed, and I didn't fall. I was just suddenly wham. This isn't an evil house as such, but that day something evil definitely did happen. I've never ever experienced that feeling in the house before. It really left me frightened. Whatever the truth about the claims, these strange events as documented in the poem about the Littlecut ghost suggest that the spirit of Wild Will may live on. Whilst Darrell's wretched spirit, it is said, as if in magic circle bound, oft by benighted rustics seen, the fatal spot to wander round. Today, Littlecut House has been converted into a hotel with a capacity for up to 400 guests. Well, those are the paying ones, at least. Some cultures take the view that, being close to the skies, mountains are suffused with magical properties. To them, the highest places in the world are a meeting point between heaven and earth. The ancient Greeks believed the summit of Mount Olympus to be the home of the gods. And Tibetan folklore tells of a mountain Shangri-La where men become immortal in a land of eternal youth. I like the sound of that one. In our second story tonight, mountain rescuers turn to the mystical forces of a cold and forbidding alpine peak. The Bavarian Alps boast Germany's highest peaks, just the challenge for keen skiers and old friends Steve Swindlehurst and Ian Middleton. In February 1994, they came to Oberammergau to tackle the infamous Mount Laber. We decided to set out around about three o'clock. We looked at it to think that it was going to be about a 25 minute journey from top to bottom. It is a black run. Um, it's powder and pieced, um, and it is quite an awesome run. When we actually got to the top of the mountain, we did actually find that the fog was starting to come in, um, which uh, lowered the visibility. Both good skiers, the two men had no fears. Ian, a former army ski instructor, went first. Despite the weather, the going was good. My father-in-law told me about the skiing on the lava, of how difficult it was, and that it was a real challenge and that Ian and I should have a go at it by the end of the holiday. We'd ski down about 150, 200 metres on a fairly steep slope. Halfway down, we realised that the, it wasn't a piece that we had obviously made a wrong turning. We, and then we realised that we were actually off piste and skiing in terrain which was quite dangerous. The two men tried to find their way back to the marked out piste which would lead them down to the safety of the village. But then disaster struck. <laughs> What I'd done, in fact, was break the binding clip. So when I tried to lock my ski back down again, it wouldn't close in the boot, and it was unable then to ski any further. By now well and truly lost, they attempted a new route towards the village, this time on foot. That was when it started to get a bit hairier. And on a couple of occasions, we came to what were, in effect, sheer cliffs. And the snow just dropped away into nothing, and you couldn't see the bottom. And the whole time, both Ian and myself were getting all dejected that we weren't going to find the, the slope. It was now getting on towards six o'clock in the evening and getting dark. The rest of the holiday party, waiting in the village below, had become worried. Ian and Steve were now seriously late. <laughs> Oberammergau's mountain rescue team were scrambled. With the temperature set to plummet to minus 20 degrees that night, the rescuers knew the men would only survive for a few hours. We went down all the official pistes first of all, then we separated into groups and went down the unofficial trails all the time calling and shouting to try and find the two men. But there was no sign of them. Of course, the darker it got, the harder it was to see where we were going. And I guess at about 7.30, 8 o'clock, we realised that we weren't going to get down that evening. By now, the two men had strayed into dense forest. I don't think we ever got anywhere near that piece. Well, whatever it is, we're not going to find it now. We're running out of daylight. Yeah. I mean, all the action, man. 
What are we going to do now? Build an igloo? At the time, both Ian and myself didn't really appreciate how cold it was getting. We realised that if we were to sit in one place, it wouldn't be the best way around to do it because you may just sit there and freeze to death. Surrounded by trees, there was little chance of the men being spotted by the rescuers. But as the search party gave up and headed back to the village, there was someone else concerned for their safety. 70-year-old George Horak has lived in Oberammergau all his life. He's an acknowledged expert on the mountains which encircle the village. But George is also a dowser. By holding his divining rod over a map of the mountains, George claims he can tap into their energy and sense what is happening on the slopes. I could feel what they felt, trapped at night on a mountain in the dark and cold. I could feel the danger they were in and that they were afraid to die. The rod showed there was something broken. I didn't know what was broken, it could have been a leg. I could also see they were sitting underneath something which had to do with earth. But I could not think for the sake of it what it could be. Some sort of shelter. Soup couple. Despite their physical exertions, Steve and Ian were starting to suffer from the bitter cold. They're bound to find us sooner or later. Yeah, hopefully sooner, before the gangrene sets in. Come on, more branches. The important thing is to keep moving. Man kann sie entweder Erfrierungen holen an verschiedenen Gliedmaßen. One can get frostbite on feet and toes, on the fingers or nose and ears. The whole body gets so cold and the body temperature sinks so low that the heart stops beating. Let's have a nip of that brandy in. I'm freezing. Just a tiny drop. Dinner. Oh. Oh. I'm still feeling in my fingers. Let's get out and move around. We shouldn't rest in one place for more than ten minutes at a time, anyway. It's at those times that you begin to feel the worst. You wonder if you're going to survive the cold, if the rescue people are going to find you in the morning. Alone on the mountain, the men had no idea that a village dowser might be their last hope. George Horak relied on the reactions of his divining rod to guide him, as he plotted what he believed was the men's exact latitude and longitude on the mountain. I told the mountain rescue team where the men could be found. Then they went back up again. I returned home, hoping that the men could be found, even if not in the place where I thought they were. The mountain rescue is grateful for all advice and investigates all the information they get. We did not think about if the advice was wrong or right. If we get advice, we follow it up. people's torches shining through the trees was absolutely amazing the sheer sense of wow we're going to get out of this and we're going to get out of it now we i guess it was then that the adrenaline stops 
working and you suddenly realise A, how cold you are and B, how tired you are. As soon as Mountain Rescue found us and they came down and they had hot sweet tea for us to drink, is we were shivering, like, absolutely shivering all over. Oh. I was absolutely shaking like a leaf. <laughs> Steve and Ian were brought down to the village cold but unharmed. It was only later that they learned just how serious their predicament had been. We were speaking to the Mountain Rescue the next day, and I was trying to explain to this guy what we'd done, the way we'd built the shelter, the working and the resting, the thing that we'd done all the way through. And he disregarded really what I, I was saying and said, it, you, you would have died. You would not have come down off that mountain. You would have been dead. It wasn't until they were back home in England that they learned about George Horak's role in their rescue. I was fairly skeptical about the whole thing. It wasn't really until I'd heard stories about the mountain rescue team doing one last run and going to an exact area pinpointed by the dowser that you realise that there probably is more to dowsing and alike than you realise. Well, I'm glad he did it. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> um, it, it's, it, we, we were told at the end of the day what he did with, with, this, with the dowsing rod was like uh, getting a needle out of a haystack. Three years on, Steve has his hands full with his 13-day-old daughter, Emily. I can remember Ian when we were sitting on the mountain um, in one of the quiet moments saying that he's got two young boys and he was absolutely adamant that he was going to come down. There was no way he wasn't. And I guess with my arrival, it, yeah, it puts everything into perspective. Some would say it was no more than a stroke of luck which enabled George to locate the skiers. Perhaps the real test would be whether he could do it again. So far, rescuers have not needed to ask him for more help, and they hope they'll never have to. Good night. <laughs>